Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Giraffe Chess channel. I am so excited to have all of you back. Uh, big shout out again to everybody who subscribed between the last video and this one. I really appreciate it, and make sure you keep subscribing and turning on notifications by ringing that little bell so that you get updated every time uh, I post new content. All right, so today marks the beginning of a very exciting new series, the Road to NM series. And this one was actually inspired by one of my subscribers, Evan Lutz, shout out to you. Uh, just goes to show that if you guys drop some suggestions in the comments, I definitely pay attention to it and I will be making videos. I'll be making a lot of videos based on what you guys have to say, because after all, I am uh, doing this with the goal of teaching you guys, educating you guys in whatever way I can. So uh, make sure that you drop something in the comments if you're really passionate about a particular topic. All right, so without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, the purpose of the series is to guide you guys with advice and tips on how to make it to the national master level. Uh, to become a national master in the US Chess Federation, you have to reach a rating of 2200. And going from unrated to 2200 is quite a big jump and it takes many, uh, many years and a lot of dedication. So I'm gonna start by doing one segment of the Road to NM, uh, part one, unrated to 1700. So I think that the jump from unrated to 1700 is very doable within a short period of time. Looking back on my rating history, I was able to make this jump relatively quickly and doing relatively the same stuff. And then after I hit 1700 is when I made some changes to my strategy. But the goal of this first part is to inform you guys on how I made it to 1700 from unrated and give you some tips on that. So let me start with tip number one. Tip number one is to play openings that you are passionate about. So if you're a competitive chess player, even just play chess for fun, you might read a lot of the time that some people say you need to pick a solid opening and stick with it. But I believe that what's more important than picking a solid opening is picking an opening that you are passionate about, picking an opening that makes you want to jump onto some online chess server and play 500 games in a row. Uh, to give you guys an example, my first openings were not your traditional Rui Lopez or the Slav or E4, E5, nothing like that. Rather, my first openings were the Sicilian Dragon the, and the Benko Gambit. So these are both very sharp openings, and some people consider the Sicilian Dragon in particular to be quite unsound. Uh, let me just put it on the board. The Sicilian Dragon occurs after e4, e5, knight to f3, d6, d4, takes, takes. The knight comes out to the f6 square. Uh, oops. <laughs> the knight comes out to f6. Uh, white's knight comes out to c3, and black plays g6. So this looks like very natural development, but the reason that this opening is a little bit controversial is because of white's opportunity to play the English attack. Uh, and this is not a dragon video, so I won't go into all of the variations, but, oh, sorry, after g6, bishop to e3, bishop to g7, uh, now white can play f3, castles, knight to c6, uh, oops, queen d2, knight c6, and queenside castles. And we get a very sharp line here where we have opposite side castling, white opting to go queenside, and black opting to go kingside. Uh, the only catch is that white has these ideas to trade off his bad bishop on e3 for black's good bishop on g7. And when I say bad bishop, it's obviously relative. Uh, White's bishop on e3 is a strong piece, but it's nothing compared to the monster that's sitting here on g7. Uh, in any position, I think any strong uh, chess player would val evaluate this bishop on e3 as an objectively good piece, but since it's worse in comparison to its counterpart on g7, trading it will be advantageous uh, for the white side. So black commonly plays bishop d7 here, that's what I played. And now bishop to h6 with the trade, and that's why this is a little bit sketchy. Uh, going back a little bit to the opening, I also mentioned that I played the Banco Gambit with black. So 
that involved pawn to d4, and then I'd play knight f6, pawn c4, c5, d5, and now b5. This is the Benko Gambit, and the idea is that black is sacrificing a pawn right out of the gates uh, with the idea of gaining peace development and actually long-term compensation, because black has very good control of these uh, b and a files. So in the future, uh, black is going to plan to get rooks and queens, all the major pieces, down these b and a files in order to generate some great counterplay. And if black can make it to that game, he'll be fine. Uh, but the reason this is a little suspect is because if you're lower rated and you don't know how to deal with the position properly, you can land yourself in a bit of trouble uh, and end up not getting compensation for the pawn. I personally have a pretty good score uh, from the white side of this line. So you really have to know how to treat this position. But the main point here is not about opening theory in the Sicilian or in the Benko Gambit. The main point is that I was very passionate about these openings. I cared a lot about playing these openings, so much so that I was excited to hop onto chess.com and play a Benko Gambit or play a Sicilian Dragon. And even if I lost, I would learn from it. And that leads me into tip number two. Uh, Tip number two is play lots of online games, uh, but this has one caveat, and that is this does not include your normal 3 plus 0 or 5 plus 0 blitz. Rather, I recommend playing 30 minute games only. From the time I was unrated to the time I was 1700, this is all I did. I would spend an, uh, an inhumane amount of time uh, going through chess.com opponents one by one, playing tons of 30-minute games every day. Uh, my weekends would be spent largely on these 30-minute games. Uh, you don't have to invest that much effort into these games to make it to 1700, uh, but the more games you play, the faster you'll reach that level. So, like I said, Blitz is not very conducive to chess improvement, especially at the beginner or intermediate player level, and you should focus more on these rapid or standard games. Uh, and secondly, as a sub tip to this, you need to analyze your chess games afterwards uh, and at first doing so without the assistance of a computer. Now, my generation is called the computer generation, uh, or I've even heard from some uh, seasoned players, the computer babies, people who will analyze their games with the computer and then think they're geniuses for finding uh, great, great moves with the help of their friends Houdini and Stockfish. Uh, and while this criticism isn't entirely valid because computers are great for chess overall, advancing it as a game, uh, one thing that you should keep in mind is that you'll get a lot better if you analyze the games yourself first, as opposed to analyzing them with the computer, because then you'll get to appreciate the computer lines a lot more. Uh, tip number three uh, is that you should watch a lot of YouTube. So... Needless to say, you are in the right place. You're on YouTube, you're watching a titled player explain how he thinks about chess, uh, how he approaches the game, and how he got to where he is today. That's exactly what you need to be doing. Uh, I personally watched a lot of YouTube when I was coming up. You need to find two or three YouTubers that you're interested in uh, and follow them regularly whenever they post, if it's something educational and not just... Uh, someone playing Blitz without any commentary, bumping EDM music in the background. As long as it's not that, if it's educational, you'll learn a lot. Because when you see higher rated players, titled players, uh, explain all of their analysis, give commentary on their games, uh, then you can truly benefit from what they're saying and even pick up on a few patterns and strategies that you didn't know before. Uh, I can attribute a lot of my early success as a chess player to just paying attention to these uh these YouTube videos, really taking mental notes on what was going on and trying to understand how these players were thinking. Uh, chess is not a solved game, but it's also not completely uh, unsolvable uh, in the sense that there's a lot that you can learn from people who are better than you. You don't get better by random luck, but by learning the patterns and the strategies that you need to, and also employing some creativity, all which you can learn from prominent YouTubers. Uh, who care about educating their subscribers. Tip number four is that you need to combine all of the first three tips that I said, which, uh, which is to say combine playing openings that you're passionate about with playing lots of online chess games, 
and uh, watching a lot of YouTube videos. Now, uh, that might seem like a cop-out from giving you an actual fourth tip, but in fact, it's not. Uh, it's actually very important to your chess development to understand that these three tips aren't isolated from one another. It's important to combine them together uh, when you're trying to improve as a chess player. So let me explain. I'll give you a few, example of, a few examples of how these can be combined. So seek opening inspiration from titled players you watch on YouTube. Uh, and play those openings in your 30-minute games, only the ones that you're most passionate about uh, in those long games, and then analyze them afterwards to see if the ideas that you're playing are consistent with the ideas that those YouTubers are playing. So to give an example, I tend to play a lot of Queen's Gambits with white, Karo Khans with black, Duchess with black, uh, and a lot of different openings that you'll see over the coming months and years. But... Uh, if you're interested in any of the openings that I play and you're sort of at this beginner intermediate level, uh, then if you try them out on your own, try to see if the ideas you saw me play match up with the ideas that you play. And that'll help you uh, better your pattern recognition. Uh, secondly, as a sub tip, compared to Blitz, playing longer games not only ensures that you get better uh, and you play better moves, but it also allows you to retain ideas from the openings you're playing. And this becomes incredibly significant when you play over the board and you know how to play the positions much better than your opponents. So, for example, uh, if you're playing a Benko Gambit online, you've played 500 games in the Benko Gambit uh, in the chess.com 30 minute pool, you're inevitably not only going to know the opening better, but you're also going to know the middle games idea, the middle game ideas better and thereby be more successful in your over the board and online chess. Uh, which leads me into my third sub tip uh, that I found it to be the case in my own experience that because of these long chess.com games, these long 30 minute games, I actually uh, understood that the opening extended far past the 10 to 15 moves that people commonly assign it. People say it's the opening until you get castled or it's the opening until you move your queen uh, enough times. But really, Opening ideas that you learn, that you master from watching YouTubers, uh, that you play in your own games, and that you watch on uh, on whatever on whatever uh, chess mediums there are, uh, all of these things will help you understand the middle games. So understand that openings extend past middle games. Openings may be the first ten to fifteen moves, uh, but the opening ideas that you will learn will extend far past that. Let me give you an example of this in action. So I played the Karo Khan for a long time, or I have been playing for the Karo Khan for a long time more accurately. Uh, I mentioned that I played the Sicilian Dragon when I first started out with chess, but because I was so passionate about the Karo Khan, I actually started playing that too. I added that to my repertoire when I was around 900 rated. And the Karo Khan has carried me all the way from 900 to the master level of 2200. So evidently, I played it when I was 1700 as well. And playing openings that you're passionate about, for me, it was the Karo Khan, which is e4, c6, d4, d5. Uh, like I said, they can help you improve a lot. Uh, and one of the cool things about playing openings you're passionate about and watching YouTube videos on it and uh, watching YouTubers who know the openings really well play is that you get to understand positions like these where your opponents will just sort of mindlessly enter these positions and they don't know what they're doing really, but you know exactly the plans that you want to employ. So this is an example of a very common game that I would get when I was around 1700. Uh, and this goes to show that if you know your opening ideas and thereby understand the middle games that come from your openings, then you'll be well equipped to get a somewhat decisive advantage even early on, as early as the early middle game. So I'd often get positions like this, and it looks simple enough, but actually here black has already equalized and is completely fine. Uh, and as black here, I would often start pushing for an edge. And what's the reason that black is even a little bit be better here? Because white has just made completely normal moves. Uh, he put both pawns in the center, e4 and d4, 
bought, brought both knights out, brought the bishop out, and castled. So how could he possibly be worse? Well, the reason is that this knight uh, is not very good on c3. It would rather be on d2 uh, so that white can play pawn to c3 or pawn to c4. But unfortunately, white played a seemingly natural move of knight to c3 and now must pay the price because pawn to c3 is not an option. So some of my opponents, especially near the beginner level, would play a move like h3 and automatically uh, fall into an easy opening trap where we take the knight and scoop up a pawn absolutely for free. But even if white doesn't give up a pawn like this and plays some sort of bishop to e3 after bishop to g4, look at uh, look at white's bishop here. It's not very good on e3. It's what we call a tall pawn. It's just standing there defending the d4 pawn, isn't doing very much. And after e6, let's say rook e1, black has very natural development here, bishop to d6. We're getting ready to castle. And as you'll see in a lot of my videos, I commonly go for this b5, b4 idea in the Karo Khan, looking to attack the queen side and put a lot of pressure on white over there. We can even follow this with a pawn storm. But all of this uh, Karo Khan theory, you could say, is uh, geared towards the point that if you understand your openings well, if you practice your openings, if you watch your openings played on YouTube, you will definitely improve, uh, especially if you take your training seriously and play those 30-minute rapid games. Uh, so that is pretty much all I have for you as far as going from unrated to 1700. I will put these tips in the description below. So if you forgot any of what I said, just feel free to check them out there. Uh, hopefully this helps and hopefully my experience of how I got from being an unrated player, an 11 year old who was joining chess a little bit late compared to his uh, peers to being 1700 in a very short amount of time. Hopefully that helps you as well. And uh, please feel free to let me know if any of this stuff works for you in the future. Uh, I would be more than happy to listen to those stories. Uh, again, if this video helped you out, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the little bell to get notifications when I post uh, and get the, latest, get the latest content that I'm putting out there. Thank you guys so much again and uh, comment if you have any video suggestions.